on World News Tonight. Russia's threat. The Kremlin strikes back to the NATO's tank donations to Ukraine with a deadly threat of retaliation. Population fall. China faces an era of negative population growth as the national birth rate hits a record low. Biden silent. Joe Biden continues to avoid questions on the case as more documents have been revealed. I have a dream. Thousands celebrate the birth date of late civil rights leader Martin Luther King in a stunning fashion. This is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News, bringing to you news from across the globe. Now tonight we begin with the soccer brawl as the Surabaya District Court in East Java began the trial of a handful of police officers and soccer match uh, organizers on charges of criminal negligence for their role in one of the world's deadliest soccer stadium stampedes last October. An Indonesian court began trial on Monday for one of the world's deadliest soccer stadium stampedes. A handful of police and match officials have been charged with negligence over their alleged roles. 135 people died in the October disaster at Kanjuranhan Stadium in Malang, East Java. An investigation by Indonesia's Human Rights Commission found police fired 45 rounds of tear gas into the crowd at the end of the match, causing panic that led to the stampede. <laughs> Investigators concluded that excessive and indiscriminate use of tear gas was the main cause of the crush, while locked doors, an overcapacity stadium, and failure to implement safety procedures exacerbated the death toll. The disaster prompted widespread questions about safety standards and the use of tear gas, a crowd control measure banned by soccer's global governing body, FIFA. On Monday, the court heard from three police officers, a security official and a match organizer, who each face a maximum prison sentence of five years if convicted. The father of one of the victims attended court on Monday. He says he hopes that they will be punished to the fullest extent, especially those who use tear gas. Indonesian President Joko Widodo announced after the incident that all league matches would be suspended and that Kanjurahan Stadium would be demolished and rebuilt. League games have since resumed, but without spectators. A follow-up story now on the promise of European nations supplying tanks to Ukraine. The Kremlin issued an overt threat that the tanks Britain plans to send to Ukraine will burn, warning the West that the supplying of new rounds of more advanced weapons to Ukraine would not change the course of the war. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov has said that Kiev's foreign backers, who have vowed to supply tanks and other heavy weapons to Ukraine, don't care about Ukrainian lives and are motivated by their desire to hurt Russia. The Russian official told journalists that promises made by Poland and the UK to provide main battle tanks to Kyiv indicate that they want the conflict in Ukraine to spiral further. He also added that those weapons will not change the outcome of the conflict. NATO and a number of individual member states have pledged to provide heavier weapons to Ukraine. The British government has vowed to deliver 14 challengers, two main battle tanks, while the US, France and Germany have committed to sending infantry fighting vehicles. Poland has also expressed its intention to send German-made Leopard tanks to the country, though Berlin has warned that doing so without its consent would violate the arms export agreement under which the armor was delivered to Poland in the first place. The supplying countries will meet this Friday at US Air Base Ramstein in Germany, the seventh gathering of its kind since Russia sent troops to its neighboring state almost 11 months ago. Moscow cited the creeping expansion of NATO into Ukraine as a threat to its national security and a major reason for its military operation. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said that the recent pledges for heavy warfare equipment to Ukraine were important and that he expects more to be made in the near future. Still on the updates on the war in Ukraine, the toll from a weekend missile strike on the central Ukrainian city of Dnipro rose to 40 as more bodies were pulled from debris of multi-story buildings. EU President Holder Sweden condemned the attack, saying it constituted a war crime. Russia, however, has denied any and all responsibility. These dogs have joined the search and rescue efforts in Dnipro. Emergency services have been working tirelessly since Saturday afternoon's attack. 
In freezing temperatures, a group of firefighters found a lightly dressed woman still alive more than 18 hours after the residential building was hit. But hopes are fading of finding more survivors, with dozens of residents still missing. Two stairwells were destroyed by the missile, which the Ukrainian military said was a KH-22 launched from Russia's Kursk region. The explosion was very long. It seemed so long. My child and I were screaming so hard that my throat hurt. I don't know what the point was. There isn't a single military facility here. This is a residential area. Russia's defense ministry said its forces had launched a wave of strikes against Ukrainian military and infrastructure sites, but did not mention Dnipro. In his nightly address, President Vladimir Zelensky vowed that the search for survivors would continue, then switched to Russian to condemn Russian people's silence. We're fighting for every person. The rescue operation will last as long as there is even the slightest chance to save lives. I want to say to all of those in Russia or from Russia, who even now are not able to utter even a word of condemnation of this terror, your cowardly silence and attempt to wait out what is happening will only end with these same terrorists one day coming for you. Russia also targeted Kyiv and Kharkiv the same day, prompting more blackouts and ending a two-week lull in the airstrikes it's launched against Ukraine's power infrastructure and urban centers since October. China's population shrank in 2022 for the first time in more than 60 years, a new milestone in the country's deepening demographic crisis with significant implications for its slowing economy. A population decline for the first time in over 60 years. Last year in China, there were nearly a million less births than in the year previous. In fact, China's birth rate in 2022 was more than half what it was 10 years ago, with only 6.77 births per thousand people. A number that is 10 points below India's birth rate and five below France. But even more significantly, the amount of deaths in the country outweighed the births, the first such occurrence since 1961 during the rule of Mao Zedong. Much of the demographic downturn is a result of China's one-child policy, imposed between 1980 and 2015. But there are other reasons cited for the decrease. China is one of the most expensive countries in the world to raise a child. A combination of factors which has resulted in a population that is getting older and older, fueling a genuine worry that one day China will not have enough people of working age to continue their role as a global superpower. Labour shortages that will also reduce tax revenue and contributions to a pension system already under pressure. It's worrying because young people don't want to have kids anymore, because the country is getting older and it creates pressure on society. Local governments have rolled out several measures in an attempt to encourage people to have more babies, including tax deductions, longer maternity leave and housing subsidies. But these steps are not expected to be enough to halt the long-term trend. And by 2035, a third of the population is expected to be over the age of 60. The search and rescue teams have found the black box of the ATR-72 aircraft of Yeti Airlines that crashed in Pokhara, killing at least 68 people. The black box has been handed over to the Nepal Army and will be submitted to a probe team in Kathmandu later in the day. The cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder from Nepal's worst plane crash in 30 years was discovered on Monday, officials said. No survivors from the flight, carrying 72 people, have yet been found. Most of those aboard were Nepali. The data on the recorders may help investigators determine what caused the Eti Airlines ATR-72 aircraft to crash in clear weather on Sunday, just before landing in the tourist city of Pokhara. An official at Kathmandu Airport said the recorders will be sent for analysis, based on the recommendation of the manufacturer. Sapana Kadkar watched from her home as the crash unfolded. I live in the house just next to the crash site. The plane crashed right across my house on a cliff. One of its wings still lies on the edge of the cliff. It came to the side of my house after bouncing back and then burst into flames. On hearing the sound, we looked out. 
and saw a huge ball of fire in the air. And then we rushed out of the house. We thought the plane was going to crash over our house when my children and I were inside. But we are lucky that God saved us. Rescuers battled cloudy weather and poor visibility as they scoured a river gorge for passengers who were unaccounted for more than 24 hours after the crash. A spokesperson for Pokhara Airport told Reuters that minutes before landing, the pilot asked for a change of runway. There are nine domestic airlines in Nepal, including Yeti Airlines and its unit Tara Air. Yeti and Tara plane crashes have killed at least 165 people in Nepal since 2000 out of a total of 359, according to data from CAAN. Another 75 people have died in helicopter crashes this century in Nepal. Sudden weather changes in the mountainous country can make for hazardous conditions, and investigations can take months or longer. Andrew Katiwada, the co-pilot of Sunday's ill-fated aircraft, lost her husband, pilot Deepak Pokhral, in a similar crash in 2006. Her remains have not been identified, but she is feared dead. An airline spokesman told that she had paid for her pilot training with the money she got from the insurance after her husband's death. Nepal has declared a day of national mourning on Monday and set up a panel to investigate the disaster and suggest measures to avoid such incidents in future. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden, despite making public appearances from time to time, has been extremely silent when asked about his connection to classified documents found in his property. The president has even avoided journalists who have repeatedly asked him questions regarding the matter. President Biden publicly silent about the special counsel's investigation into his handling of classified material. How do you think that the classified documents got into your boxes? Ignoring reporters' questions for a fourth straight day, while privately expressing frustration with the growing backlash, according to three sources familiar with the matter. It comes as the White House revealed this weekend additional pages of classified documents were discovered inside the president's Delaware home. So far, the total number of classified records recovered is unclear, with about a dozen identified at Mr. Biden's private office, including at least one document marked top secret, followed by two batches discovered at the Wilmington residence, including inside the garage. None of those sites are approved to store sensitive government material. The White House now facing intensifying criticism about a lack of transparency. The first classified documents were discovered by Biden attorneys a week before the midterms, but the public was not told until just last week, only following media reports. The president's personal attorney insisting they cannot release certain details, quote, relevant to the investigation while it is ongoing. The White House has pledged to cooperate with the special counsel noting differences in volume and response to the classified records found at former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. But some Democrats saying national security may have been jeopardized by where Mr. Biden was storing classified documents. Matteo Messina and Denaro, one of the bosses of the Cosa Nostra Mafia in Sicily and Italy's most wanted man, has been arrested by police while being treated in a private health clinic in Palermo. He had been a fugitive since 1993 and was considered by Europol one of the most wanted men in Europe. This is the moment Italy's most wanted mafia boss was arrested by police on Monday. Matteo Messina De Naro was visiting a private hospital in the Sicilian capital Palermo. Military Police Major General Pasquale Angelo Santo. Today, members of the Carabinieri's Special Operations Group and members of the Special Intervention Group and the Territorial Commands of the Sicily region, as part of investigations coordinated by the Public Prosecutor's Office of Palermo, arrested fugitive Matteo Messina Denaro inside a health facility where he had gone to undergo clinical therapies. He has been sentenced in absentia to a lifetime for his role in the 1992 murders of anti-mafia prosecutors Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino. 
He also faces a life sentence for his role in bomb attacks in Florence, Rome and Milan, which killed 10 people the following year. Messina De Naro, who comes from the small town of Castelvetrano near Trapani, is accused by prosecutors of being solely or jointly responsible for numerous other murders in the 1990s. In 1993, he helped organize the kidnapping of a 12-year-old boy, Giuseppe Di Matteo, in an attempt to dissuade his father from giving evidence against the mafia, prosecutors say. The boy was held in captivity for two years before he was strangled and his body dissolved in acid. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni said the arrest is a great victory for the state that shows it never gives up in the face of the mafia. South Korean Yoon suk yeol has announced that Korean Republic is committing 400 billion won or $308 million a year to the development of small nuclear reactors as it doubles its overall annual spending on nuclear energy to 2 trillion won. South Korea's efforts to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 will depend in part on a return to nuclear power, despite the previous administration attempt to move away from it. This from South Korean President Yoon suk yeol in an address on Monday at Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. His remarks made in front of UAE President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan underline Seoul's commitment to nuclear power as it works to finish the first atomic power plant on the Arabian Peninsula. Noting the UAE's pledge to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, Yoon applauded the country for being the first one to commit to this in the Middle East. To join efforts in developing clean energy, it will not only enhance their energy security, but also contribute to global energy market stability. Specifically, he referred to the UAE's Mazdar City, a planned city project that will be run on sustainable energy and resources. He said UAE's knowledge in developing and operating such a city and South Korea's IT and infrastructure technology can create sustainable cities around the world. The speech came on the third day of President Yoon's state visit. At the venue were also South Korean business leaders and top officials who accompanied the president on the trip. This includes Finance Minister Chu Kyung-ho as well as heavyweights in the private sector such as Samsung Electronics Chairman Lee Jae-yong and SK Group Chief Cha Tae-won. Relatives of those killed in the 2020 Beirut port blast say that they have become targets of the judiciary instead of senior officials who have still not been held to account for the huge explosion that devastated Lebanon's capital and killed 220 people. Protesters gathered outside this Beirut police station say Lebanon is applying the law unequally. A dozen people were called in for questioning amid accusations of rioting. After last week's protests over the city's massive port explosion in 2020. But demonstrators who count victims' relatives among them want to know what about senior officials who have still not been taken to task for the blast? <laughs> this corrupt state is demanding victims' relatives come in for questioning, said this mother of a victim. Where are those who blew up Beirut port? The blast devastated Lebanon's capital and killed 220 people. But only minor players have been brought in by authorities so far, with the work of an investigating judge paralyzed by political elites in the country's fractured sectarian system. <laughs> this is William Noon, a prominent campaigner who was among those called for questioning on Monday. He lost his brother in the blast. We will appear before the courts. We demand the law to be applied. We are not above the law, we are under the law, but on the condition that everyone is under the law. Lebanese media broadcast footage of noon at the protest saying protesters had prepared men, rioters, dynamite and rocks if the judiciary appointed an additional investigator to the probe, a move family sphere was designed to hobble it further. A judicial source said noon was detained over threats to the judiciary. For many Lebanese, the failure of the probe into the blast reflects the impunity of the elites that have overseen decades of corrupt rule that led to the country's financial collapse in 2019. The explosion was caused by hundreds of tons of chemicals kept in poor conditions for years at the port. Judicial sources say an extra judge would be able to release detainees, including the port's former customs chief. Families fear those behind the blast could roam free as hope fades fast for justice.
Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Thick plumes of dark smoke were seen rising from an oil tanker station in Samut Sangkram, Thailand after a blast was heard and a fire broke out on the ship moments before. No casualties have been reported thus far. Peruvian protesters headed to Lima to call for the resignation of President Dina Beluarte in demonstrations which continued in the capital. In southern city, protesters set off for Lima in a convoy of trucks while another caravan was left stranded in Ica as police blocked their passage. At least 130 homes have been impacted by a burst of seismic activity in El Salvador, leaving over a dozen people in shelters. Authorities reported that the country was hit with over 219 earthquakes from Sunday afternoon until Monday morning. Flames engulfed the logistics center near the northwestern French city. According to Sign Maritime Firefighters, the incident was due to a lithium battery fire in the building. French fashion house Dior named K-pop star Jimin a global brand ambassador. Broadcasting the tie-up on social networks with images of the BTS singing in a sporty looks with an outdoor flair. The move comes as European luxury houses look to tap into the global popularity of K-pop stars, particularly with younger shoppers. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with visuals of crowds filling the streets of Houston, Texas to celebrate the birthday of late civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Stay safe and have a good night.